Good evening and welcome to Elmhurst University. I'm Troy Van Aken, the 14th president of Elmhurst, and we are thankful that you have joined us this evening. Tonight marks the 30th anniversary of our Holocaust Studies programming. Over the years, we have addressed the complexities and hard questions that the Holocaust represents. For all our students, faculty, and the larger community, we believe that in looking at the Holocaust in a systematic and ordered fashion, we better prepare our students for meaningful and purposeful lives of change and care for all. As Elmhurst soon begins its 150th anniversary, we continue to be strongly recognized for our student-centered work in education, formation, and empowering our students to become leaders. And tonight is an example of how we put our values and mission together. The Holocaust Lecture has a distinguished record of commanding speakers, including Ellie Weisel and Deborah Lipstadt, and our guest tonight was suggested to us by the Chicago Board of Rabbis. We're extremely pleased to host the Reverend Dr. Stephen Ray, President of Chicago Theological Seminary, a sister institution of the United Church of Christ. Dr. Ray brings a learned and important message to our series this evening. As is our tradition, our annual Yom HaShoah service of remembrance is led by Rabbi Stephen Bob. It's now my pleasure to pass our evening to Rabbi Bob and Cantor Cindy. Thank you again for being with us this evening. We have to study the Holocaust at Elmhurst University because the Holocaust stands as testimony against everything we stand for as a university and everything we stand for as a society as a university, we believe in the value of learning. We hold that knowledge leads to virtue. We hold that Western civilization has value. We hold that religion in general and Christianity in particular have value. The Holocaust raises questions about the pursuit of knowledge, before World War II, Germany stood at the center of Western civilization. 
Germany was the country of Kant and Hegel, Beethoven and Bach, Goethe and Schiller. Germany was the center of the academic study of the Bible and the birthplace of modern physics. In the center of learning and culture, the Nazi party came to power. The German devotion to knowledge and education did not prevent Germans from supporting the Nazis. Quite the opposite. The German state used this devotion to knowledge, engineering, and science to kill Jews and others more efficiently. The Holocaust raises questions about Western civilization. Western civilization rests on the premise that all individuals have value. The Nazis rejected this basic idea. The Nazis and their supporters did not believe that all people are created equal. The Nazis proclaimed that Jews, homosexuals, and Roma are not people. The history of our university places upon us a particular obligation to respond to these questions. The founders of our university in 1872 were members of the German Evangelical Synod of North America. In the early years of our school, all the courses were taught in German. Elmhurst imported it its textbooks from Germany. Students spoke German among themselves. The Kaiser's birthday was a school holiday. Because the Holocaust stands as testimony against everything that we stand for, everything we stand for as a university and everything we stand for as a society, we have to confront it. We have to ask and answer the hard questions. What does the Holocaust mean for me in my life? In the life of our community, in the life of our nation, in the life of the world? Lighting candles has always been a central part of our service of remembrance. In the spring of 2021, we cannot physically gather together in our usual way. While we may be sitting in our own homes, we are still gathering together, gathering virtually, gathering spiritually. A few of us came together as your representatives in the chapel to light these candles. We light seven candles in memory of the six million Jews and five million others who were defined out of existence and killed by the Nazis and their collaborators in Europe from 1933 to 1945. In addition to the Jews, the victims of the Holocaust included Poles, Roma, and Sinti, homosexuals and physically and mentally disabled people. We like to honor the work of those Jews, Christians, and others who were rescuers, resistors, and liberators. We light these candles to remember, to question, and to look to our common responsibilities to care for humanity.
May their memory be as a blessing to all. As we close this, our Yom HaShoah service, Elmhurst University has gathered like this for 30 years. And as we begin the 150th anniversary of this university, these services and the lecture to follow represent the values, the hopes, and the dreams of our community. It is that sense of power and grace and love that as the chaplain of this university, we ask all to remember and then to work for change. May their memories be as a blessing, and may we now close this, our Yom HaShoah service, that God Almighty will carry us, strength and blessings to you, and grace for all of us. Amen. Amen. Good evening all. It is with thankfulness that we gather here this evening as the university community, as the chaplain of the college and the chair of the Holocaust Committee. It is that sense of grace that we are able to do this and I am so thankful for Professor Christina Summers and her students that helped with Rabbi Bob and Cantor Cindy in the Yom HaShoah service. I know you might not have been able to hear but each of the students called out their name because we talk about in saying your name or their name, we become witnesses. And tonight is a witnessing moment, a witness to what has happened and where we are as a U.S. society 
in the midst of so many things. And so it is in that sense of all the stories that are told, all the classes that are taught, the trips to Skokie, to Europe, to Washington, D.C., the work of this community on an ongoing organized basis to examine the Holocaust, to understand the implications therein through all the academic disciplines, and to speak to the title that our guest speaker has offered tonight in moral reckoning. Those were the themes that this committee founded itself upon and they continue to live themselves out day by day. For the students in our community, starting tomorrow on Monday, there will be gatherings of different faculty throughout the week. An email will be going out tomorrow to all of you listing where those gatherings will be. It's a chance to reflect on tonight's lecture and to understand and to talk more about the material that Dr. Ray will be presenting to us. President Van Aken also mentioned that within the 30th anniversary of this project is the 150th anniversary of the university. I invite all of you to help me and others reflect on what that means, the crossover and intersection of what the Holocaust, the 30th anniversary of higher education here and in this 150th. We are a college now university of the United Church of Christ and the values permeate the entire community. And so it is that sense of moral reckoning, of goodness and evil, that we are so thankful to have someone of such stature to join us tonight. The evening is being taped, so it will be able to be shown and used throughout the next couple weeks and months. And to help me with our introduction, a member of our own committee, the Holocaust guest team, is our chair of our religious studies department. Dr. Maladin Turk comes to us with his PhD from LSTC down right next to where CTS is, Dr. Ray, and is also a member of the science, technology, and theological work around the world. He sits in a particular place and has been so helpful in our work here. So we could think of no one better to introduce Dr. Ray than Professor Dr. Maladin Turk. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Turk as he brings introductions and words to our community? Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Matini. The title of the Elmhurst University Holocaust Lecture today is Moral Reckoning, Geographies of Goodness and Evil. And the lecture is Reverend Dr. Stephen J. Ray Jr., the president of Chicago Theological Seminary. In addition, he is the president of the Society for the study of black religion. Besides his institutional leadership roles, President Ray is also a renowned constructive theologian. Having written and lectured broadly in the areas of systematic theology, African-American religion, human rights, and the intersection of religion and politics, President Ray's current work focuses on reinvigorating the public square as a place for all and reclaiming a wide, vital risk expression of progressive religion in that project. President Ray received his Master of Divinity degree from Yale University Divinity School and his Doctor of Philosophy degree in a dual program between Religious Studies at the Yale Divinity School and the African American Studies program at Yale University. President Ray's writings include Silence by the Night, a constructive reconstrual of the Protestant doctrine of sin, which was also his PhD thesis. His book, Do No Harm, Social Sin and Christian Responsibility was published by Fortress in 2002. And in 2003, he contributed to Constructive Theology, a contemporary approach to classical times. In 2007, he co-authored Black Church Studies, an introduction. And in 2012, he edited we Have Been Believers, an African-American Systematic Theology, which was the 20th anniversary edition of a book by James H. Evans Jr. And it came out from Fortress. And in 2016, he co-edited A Wait to the Moment, an Introduction to Theology, published by Westminster John Knox. On a personal note, <clears throat> I, met, I met President Ray some years ago through American Theological Society Midwest 
In 2016, President Ray attended and gave a talk at the ATS conference here on the campus of Elmhurst University. A year later, he delivered his presidential address to that society in Hyde Park, and his talk was titled, Reli The Religion of Race, the Demonic in the Quotidian. In all his writings and lectures, his keen insight into the fact of the matter and the breadth of his constructive proposals is impressive. In Awake to the Moment, together with Laurel Schneider, he writes, and I quote, Another call for theological engagement in our time is the precipitous rise of religious extremism around the world, with its demands for sameness and the militarization of disciples. Religious people of a multitude of spiritual traditions who together understand God's creation to reflect not sameness, but a vast harmony of differences, must help those of their own communities to understand the challenges of living in a world of sometimes uncomfortable otherness and of sometimes unsettling challenges, to understand the challenges as expressions of God's own life and existence rather than as threats to it. The terrifying destruction that violent religious extremism promotes and valorizes is a provocation to theology by theologians. It is a kind of gauntlet thrown before theologians, a theological claim that God favors some over the others and justifies the extermination or intimidation of those who differ. Theologians have the choice of ceding God to these interpretations or of vigorously accepting the challenge to interpret God otherwise. It is a theological opportunity as much as a dire need." End quote. Given that, besides the ever-present evils of poverty and overall socioeconomic inequality, we in this country and around the world are witnessing the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of racism, especially against African Americans, Asian Americans, Islamophobia, xenophobia, and general hate fueled by fears of, among other things, the so-called great replacement extremist ideology, and that our total population is exposed to attacks from a segment of our society that are afraid that equal rights for minorities means that their rights will be taken away, I cannot imagine us having a more relevant speaker for this event to share his insight and his wisdom. Please help me welcome Reverend Dr. Stephen J. Ray, Jr. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that kind introduction, Professor Turk. I'd also like to thank President Van Aken, Reverend Matheny for this kind uh, invitation by which I am deeply honored. And I want to give a special thanks to the superstar among us in these days of Zoom, David Martinez, the tech guy. So thank you, David, for all the work that you're doing. It's our pleasure on behalf of the school. <laughs> So I think what I want to um, do tonight is I want to share some thoughts with you about the Holocaust. Now I say specifically share some thoughts with you because I am always hesitant and always a bit concerned when I hear people use the language of, well, what can we learn from the Holocaust? What can we learn from what happened? And, and the, one of the reasons why is because the lessons of the show are so thoroughly awash in a sea of unimaginable that to not cognitively be overwhelmed, to me, is a mark that one has not taken the matter seriously enough. I've been studying the Holocaust now for over 40 years, and I find myself perennially overwhelmed by the unimaginable character of it. Certainly, we can describe it. But in terms of talking about it as understanding so that it can become a pedagogical tool, I think that that can be a bit problematic. So what I'm wanting to do this evening then is to simply share some thoughts with you that might contribute to illumination of what I believe to be an unexplored terrain and making sense of this horrifically absurd chapter in human history. 
Now let me get, begin by saying that my own disruption in studying the Holocaust, and what I mean by my own disruption, I mean my, my continual uncomfort and wanting to create discomfort in the field of Holocaust studies these last years has been that many reflections on this atrocity have dealt with the idea that it was a failure of public morality on a grand scale, that the Holocaust record that represents a failure of public morality. And while that certainly is descriptive, I think that it, does, it, it misses quite a few things and it's also a bit seductive of other things. Let me say a bit more. Many of the studies of the motivations of both the architects and the bystanding witnesses proceed from the idea that there was something defective in the moral universe of the Germans and their willing collaborators across Europe. It has been described in many ways, from Jonah David Goldhagen's indictment of the German history and culture as a breeding place for a uniquely lethal anti-Semitism in Hitler's willing executioners, which was a book that set off a tremendous amount of uh, um, a tremendous amount of discussion and a tremendous amount of disagreement in the field of European studies as well as Holocaust studies. But from that point, all the way to Robert Michael's uh, book, Holy Hatred, in which he suggested that the history of Christianity as such and its development was a classroom for Jew hatred that grew in intensity through two millennia. So both of them are wanting to add many authors along with them. I just picked those two because they were the preeminent people. What they want to suggest is that we're looking at a discrete moral failure, but a very large one that's applicable to an entire society. Now, what I want to suggest is that the terrain of these explorations become one in which the moral universe is the point. Now, that'll make more sense as I talk um, a bit further on, but they're wanting to problematize an entire moral universe and be able to talk about a whole society, be able to talk about a whole culture, be able to talk about a whole civilization, be able to talk about a whole religion. So they're wanting to take a universal stroke and try to begin to use that then as an explanatory tool for understanding how it is that the Holocaust was possible and where it came from. Now, this situation of understanding the Holocaust then leads to a, a significant texture or insight uh, which places malformed ideology at its center. So by trying to deal with something universal, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to talk about a comprehensive worldview and ideology that is sufficient to describe an entire society and its participation in the Holocaust. Now, in John Weiss's book, Ideology of Death, it remains among the most prominent that makes the argument that it is an ideological formation that is distinct to Germany in the late 19th and into the 20th century that creates the seedbed for the Holocaust to actually happen. Now, I would suggest that while there is something significant to be found in exploring ideological formations that contribute to a worldview which becomes genocidally lethal, this also invites us to what I describe as the conceit of modernity. Before I name that, let me step back for a moment and tell you what I mean by ideological formation. An ideological formation is when ideas about people, about culture, about language, about goodness, about evil, all coalesce so that they create a worldview that is an expression of a prior ideological commitment. Now, one of the things where we've seen this happen, particularly in our time, 
is when people talk about the operation of white supremacy. That's an analog to talking about an ideological formation. So what I'm suggesting then is that and uh, appealing to what Weiss's point is as an ideological formation is helpful, but it misses a significant point in my, um, uh, in my assessment. Because what it does is it calls us to embrace what I've called the conceit of modernity. And that conceit is recognizing the gap between right thinking and false consciousness provides a sufficient explanatory tool that describe for interpreting the motivation to embrace an embodiment of radical evil. So when looking at the Holocaust, what this means is that the conceit of modernity is that if you can point to a corrupted ideology, if you can point to um, a malformed ideological formation that becomes the worldview of an entire society, then you can now explain how it is that the Holocaust happened. And you might then be able to learn how to keep it from happening again. Now I say this is a conceit of modernity because from Kant, through Hegel, through Marx, through Heidegger, through Milbank, this has been the bedrock conviction that entrancement by evil is primarily an epistemological problem. It's primarily a problem about learning and understanding. Now, all we have to do to see this at work is step back and look at how often when we talk about issues like race relations, or when we talk about issues like anti-Semitism, or when we talk about issues like uh, uh, anti-immigrant xenophobia, think about how often you hear the answer, well, if we can just come together and understand one another, if we can come together and be with one another, then we will be able to work these things out. Now, all of these presume that what the fundamental problem is, is a problem of understanding of lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge. Now, a problem then rightly understood on this account can be dealt with by right knowing. That's why I say it's an epistemological problem, that if we know the right way and know the right thing, then we will be able to escape the millennia long history of human participation in genocide, war, et cetera, and we will be able to ensure that something like the Holocaust never happens again. Now, I would not go so far as to say that this conceit of modernity is fundamentally flawed. I would, however, suggest that it leads to a kind of existential arrogance, which leaves us unprepared for the onslaught of the irrational. Now, you know, I think it's particularly timely that I'm giving this lecture and talking about the power of the irrational as we see so many of our fellow country folk grasped and captured by the ideology of, Q of QAnon and how we've seen our cultural discussion about false facts, alternative realities, you know, this points to us about the power of irrationality. When we talk about the election that we just came through, and by every measure, it was one of the safest elections in the history of our nation, yet probably 30% of the people in our society believe that it was flawed with no evidence at all. So we are always unprepared for the power of the irrational. So if we have our entire commitment to using right thinking as an explanatory tool for understanding the Holocaust, then you can understand why it is that we would be in difficulty. Now, I, along with others, see the irrational as precisely the playground of the genocidal imagination. Because recall that 
It was conspiracy theories that animated Adolf Hitler. It was conspiracy theories that animated uh, Martin Heidegger. It was conspiracy theories that animated the Nazi party, whether it be the protocols of the elders of Zion or the world conspiracy that the Jews were carrying out in Europe at the time. All of these were conspiracy theories akin to what we've heard espoused by the QAnon movement and other movements within our society. So that's why I want to say that the irrational then is the playground of the genocidal imagination. And to the extent that we don't recognize that and treat it as if it is an epistemological problem, then we will always find ourselves aghast at what the results of those captured by this irrational ideology is. Now, let me pause here to make explicit two realities which shape my analysis as I move through this material. So the first is that I am an Augustinian shaped by a Calvinist understanding of the Christian faith and human, and human beings. In Christian circles, this means that I am among those who operate with somewhat of a less than generous understanding of human intellectual capacity as a sufficient grounding for moral being in the world. Put another way, I'm suspicious that humans always believe themselves able to behave better morally than they actually behave in the world. I am ever suspicious of claims that if we think about something the right way, we will be more likely to do the right thing. I have become over the years a convicted Calvinist because, and this is the second commitment, I have lived as a black man in the United States for my entire life. And I've made my life in both the church and the academy. Life in each of these spaces and American society more generally has acquainted me with far too many good people and far and perhaps a greater number of smart people largely oblivious to the ways they are shaped by and in their living and work reinscribed the racial common sense which make anti-blackness and white supremacy such intractable realities within our public life. So the evidence of my life, the evidence of our society, and as a, as a student of history, the evidence is clear that we have believed ourselves more capable of thinking our way through the problem of evil and its mesmerization than we have actually been able to demonstrate within our living. Thus, my suspicion of grand theories of interpreting the Holocaust or any other moral catastrophe and catastrophic human tragedy and somehow then learning how not to make it happen again. So I needed to share with that with you so that I come to this and my analysis is one that is shaped by both my sense as a Christian theologian in a particular tradition, but then also as a keen observer of human history, but then also as a, part, as a particular participant in the unfolding of American history over these last six decades. Now, my approach um, then to how I'm gonna be describing this is that while having pedagogical implications, so there are ways that we can learn about our teaching, I'm not about the Holocaust and, and sort of ways we can understand things. It has not been one that seeks to learn through lessons as much as the discovery of new terrains of illumination. And what I mean by that with the idea of new terrains of illumination is that as we study the Holocaust in many and different multiple ways, there are things that we see 
that help us gaze upon our contemporary reality in ways that reflect back so perhaps we might be able to see a bit more. Now, as I use this approach, and as I think about the approach, when I'm trying to see something, I'm not trying to learn or understand something, but occasionally because of the way that I'm approaching the material, there are things that make themselves apparent. So for instance, I've been a student of both African-American history and the Holocaust for at least four decades now. I came to the study when I was in high school. And I, and I ran across the book, The Trial of Adolf Eichmann by Hannah Arendt. And as a young 15 year old, even though I had witnessed the depravity of racism within our own society, and even though um, I was surrounded by a number of Jewish students, teachers, et cetera, this was during the time when the Holocaust was not spoken about. This was during the time before the epic event, Shoah on NBC, which actually created the possibility for us to describe this. So I've been studying both of these for many years. Now, I've not approached them as comparative phenomena, as have scholars such as Lawrence Thomas in his work, Vessels of Evil, American Slavery and the Holocaust, Rather, I have simply proceeded with both inquiries with the hope <clears throat> that they might cast light upon one another, and therefore I might be able to see something that will help me in terms of further interpreting the reality of what happened without trying to reduce it then to one major explanatory category. Now, one such discovery happened quite by chance. I was researching the geography of mass murders of Jews, not focusing exclusively on death camps as many people do, but I wanted to look at the entire phenomenon. I was researching that geography for a class that I was teaching on sin and evil. I ran across a map which seemed very familiar, though, I had not seen it before. And I realized it reminded me and was evocative of a map that I had seen of lynchings in the United States. So I'm gonna share my screen now and we'll, we'll have a quick look at that map and I will explain to you about why it is that um, uh, it was particularly evocative for me. So let's see. Desktop. And let's do this one. So the first thing I want you to notice about this map is that you see that there are particular places on the map where there were mass killings. You see it ranging all the way from uh, uh, the Soviet Union on through uh, France, but there were mass killings. But one thing I want you to note is that the entire map is not red. So then when I look at the map of lynchings within the United States, one of the things I want you to see as well is that while there are concentrations of lynchings, the entire map is not orange. That there are multiple spaces and places in which there were no reported lynchings. Now, one of the things I wanna uh, sort of be clear about is that we so often look at and think about the horror of what happened, that we can sometimes lose sight of the fact that it had a particularity and it had a specificity. Now in noticing this and noticing this specificity, the point of connection that I want to make was that each showed a geography of concentrated murder 
which did not encompass the entire map. Said di differently, each of the maps detailed contiguous areas which either participated in atrocity or not. Now these maps further brought to mind two books for me. And the books that I'm gonna stop sharing uh, now, um, but they brought together two, uh, brought to mind two books. One was uh, one that many of you may be familiar with, The Destruction of the Jewish Community of Yawabna in Poland by Jan Gross, and also Christopher Browning's classic, Ordinary Men, Reserve Battalion 101 and the Final Solution. The first book begins with the question of how a town can wake up one morning with half of the town deciding to kill the other half of the town, people who had been their neighbors for their entire lives, people who had been their parents' neighbors for their entire lives, people who had been their grandparents' neighbors for their entire lives. How do they wake up one morning and decide to simply kill them? The point of the book is to tell a story of the Holocaust in which Germans did not participate beyond any meaningful way, beyond creating a structure of permission for the slaughter. So while there were German troops in Yawadna, they did not participate in the destruction and killing of the Jewish population. That was all done at the hands of their neighbors. That's the title of the book. Now, in Browning's chronicle of the lethal activities of Police Battalion 101, there are interspersed stories of Jew hunts. Now, these were frequently occasioned by the failure of some towns to turn their Jewish neighbors over to the Germans, creating the need for the Germans to hunt them down themselves because they were getting no help from the local populace. So while never in the majority, there were geographic spaces in which a moral universe existed, which did not believe it wholly appropriate to participate in atrocity and then there were those who lived in a moral universe in which it was. So we had two different moral universes often sharing a contiguous geographical area. Now similarly, while researching the geography of lynchings of Black people in the United States, I noticed that there were concentrations of these killings and areas where there were not. So you would have one county in which you might have 10 in one year, and you'd have a county right next door in which there were none throughout the entire period of lynchings within the United States. Now, often these areas were contiguous to one another. Now, an additional nuance that's important to remember that we often forget is that Prior to the racial ethnic cleansings of the South and Midwest of the first decades of the 20th century and the massive European migration of that same period to the United States, our country was far more integrated than people actually recall. So if you go back and if you look at the census records from the 1890 census and from the 1900 census, you see a picture of a nation which was far more integrated than any of us believed possible. So what that means for this discussion is that the differing paths chosen between atrocity or not cannot be explained by simple appeal to demographics. So it's not that in one county, more Black people were lynched because there were more Black people, because Black people were everywhere. The point was that there was something going about this county and the one right next door to it that the people inhabited, what I'm describing as different moral universes. 
there was something about the moral universe is inhabited by these contiguous but not analogous spaces, which led to different outcomes in relation to barbarism. Now, what I'm suggesting is that there existed a moral gap visible in the geography of places of atrocity, where either a Jew or a Black person found themselves might quite literally mean life or death. This ambiguity of space leads me to ponder whether what we are dealing with and what I'm going to suggest we're dealing with are different moral universes existing beside one another in space and in time. Now you recall from the beginning of the lecture, I want to problematize uh, conversations that want to hold that there was a singular moral universe that they all inhabited and some just happened to be bad actors and others were not. I'm wanting to suggest that there may well be different moral universes altogether. Now the literature of multiverses is particularly helpful here in its openness to the idea that incongruent universes can simultaneously coexist. Now, given that the very notion of morality is inextricably bound to the provocation of actions and behaviors, might not distinctly different actions and behaviors point to distinctly different provocations or distinctly different moral universes? Now, in using the idea of different contiguous moral universes, I'm trying to do more than explain the lethality of different outcomes. I'm trying to open an imaginative space that at once has the power to take seriously the mesmerizing power of evil, the power of resistance, and the re reality of autonomy. One of the underexplored dimensions of these histories of atrocity has been that of what I describe as the white spaces on these maps. Now you may recall, um, and I'm gonna put this up again just so we can um, have a quick view of it again. Hold on a moment. Because what I'm gonna want to suggest, uh, there we go. What I'm gonna want us to look at and, and see is the spaces between, the spaces between the orange spots and the red spots. Because those are spaces that I'm gonna to want to be talking about in terms of them being, in terms of them being alternative moral universes. So we're actually seeing and looking at maps of different moral universes. We're seeing how they're coexisting with one another in the same geographic area and certainly are connected to each other by language, by custom, by business, by habit, et cetera. But because of some unique difference, they inhabit significantly different spaces in terms of us um, seeing what the lethal outcomes are for existing in either one of them. Now, while the, the spaces which represent geographies contiguous to atrocity, but not part of it, so these white spaces. Now, while the literature on perpetrators, bystanders, and righteous Gentiles is substantial and growing, Scholarship about these geographic spaces, the moral universes which people inhabited that did not lead them to murder their neighbors is not extensive. Hearkening to the beginning of this lecture, the deployment of grand theories of morality and explanations for the Holocaust simply do not have the capacity for such imaginings. So that's what I meant a little bit earlier. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is trying to create a new imaginative space because I think that for much of the literature that tries to talk about and teach what happened and what lessons we can take from the Holocaust, 
don't have that capacity, precisely because they rely on a truncation of imagination. The discrete character of these spaces of non-atrocity remain opaque. Now, I want to suggest that this opacity has two problematic outcomes. First, it maintains our focus on the spaces of atrocity with the idea that if we can somehow understand them, we might not replicate them. Now, while a common response, human history, as I've suggested, is replete with evidence that with catastrophic atrocity, we are dealing with more than flawed understanding. We can understand the mechanisms of a thing, yet still be caught unaware by its actual operation. In the case of our explorations tonight, the history of lethal anti-Semitism was well known in Europe in the 19th and 20th century. The idea of the technological imperative was growing in its acceptance. And recall the technological imper imperative is that if we have technology, we have to use it. And the sheer brutalization of people evoked by war was a story as old as humanity. Yet, even with all of this knowledge, how many were and are continually caught unaware by the Holocaust? How many were caught unaware by it, even though they understood all of these different mechanisms, they understood what was behind the Holocaust, but when the gravity of the thing descends upon them, their understanding evaporates overnight. So understanding the universe of the perpetrators and the tribe of folded arms, as my friend Yehiel Puko describes bystanders, is simply insufficient. Second, I think we miss the opportunity to gain frames and imaginative um, uh, uh, ways of understanding to describe how frail humanity resists the mesmerizing power of evil. I say frail because as a Christian shaped by the categories of my tradition, I think of the world as a fallen place. By this, I mean that the world as we have it, the world we live in, is neither the world that God created nor the world that God desires. It is a world which God loves passionately and whose flourishing is among God's vital concerns but it's not the world that God created, which is a world that, at least according to the imaginings of our shared scripture, uh, in terms of the Christian, Jewish, and Islamic traditions, it was a world in which the law of the predator was not the basic reality of our existence. Now, the Christian explanation for this has been the deformation of the world by the presence and power of sin. For the purposes of this lecture, I will simply describe it as frailty, which creates an imaginative space for evil to masquerade and flourish because it is described as the good. Now, being attentive to the geographies which resist atrocity, we can see what human living and being looks like when it is not in bondage to this masquerade. Now, significant provocation for the intellectual trajectory gestured to in this lecture is Philip Halley's book, Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. And particularly the subtitle has always captured my imagination. The story of the village of La Chambon and how goodness happened there. This book chronicles the way a small village in the French Alps saved more than a thousand Jews from the Vichy government and the German army, both bent on their destruction. It was a poor town of farmers, shepherds, vintners and the like, yet from their want, they were able to make plenty and in doing so create one of the few spaces in which the light shone in the midst of a great darkness. So they created one of the, the white spaces. Now, in Haley's telling of the story, it is clear 
that these were simple human beings with all of our complexities, with all of our frailties, and with all of our faults. These were not angels or perfect creatures by any stretch of the imagination. They were simply human. But that is the whole point. They were humans who inhabited a moral universe that allowed them to be saviors of their neighbors and not accessories to their execution. They were humans who, when a knock came at the door, revealing a frightened Jewish mother and her two children, they did not close the door and they did not call the police. Haley does a good job of trying to describe the universe which they inhabited and how it came to be, but he doesn't try to explain it. He simply describes it. Now, it is simply a story of a place where goodness happened, a geography, if you will. If you want to see a great movie that was uh, made in the last couple of years, um, that's a fictionalized account of this. Uh, the name of the movie is Waiting for Anya. Waiting for Anya, and you can see it on Netflix, and I highly recommend it. So in this book, he's trying to give us an account of what one of these spaces and geographies looks like. Now, a significant point of this lecture has been to suggest that there is utility in dispensing with the notion that grand theories of morality are particularly helpful in understanding the Holocaust. While I could not go into detail, I gesture toward the idea that this particular conceit of modernity, parenthetically captured in Kant's categorical imperative, leads us to focus on the activities of the perpetrators and the tribe of the folded arms, even if their use is as a negative example. Instead, I suggested we not seek singular moral universes, but rather explore a moral multiverse in which discrete geographies are created in which goodness can happen even while contiguous to geographies of atrocity. Now the spaces of geographies might display what good, or rather these spaces or geographies might display what goodness looks like in our fallen world and illumine how they might grow. And they grow because we understand and we actually gain something from seeing them. Now I close with the simple thought. I've spoken a bit longer than I planned, so I thank you for your forbearance, but I close with the simple thought. Well, a chain of thoughts. There were too many good people for the Holocaust not to happen. There were too many good people for the reign of terror that was the age of lynching not to happen in the United States. And I worry that there are too many good people for the next moral calamity to befall humanity not to happen. I can only pray that there will be some places in time and space, some geographies, in which the annihilated might find refuge. Thank you. Join me, beloved, in thanking Dr. Ray and what a important place to start. If any of you wish to type something in, I've got a bunch of things, but I have one first, Stephen, that is really helpful. It's a long question, but let me try to put it on the table with you. Does new moral imagination allow the geographically connected moral universes to see each other in their humanity, meaning the, uh, frag uh, the fragility and fragmentation, and move to humanness embodied by mutual intersubjective compassion, care, mercy, and justice? Does that, I'm not sure if you can see the question also, yeah. it's in the chat. 
Yes. Well, I think that it's a, a good question. And I think that one of the things that I would, ar well, I won't say I would argue, but that I would sense is that the inhabitation of a universe that has and creates moral beings such that they are resistant to the participation in atrocity would likely be a moral universe that is able to see the humanity of others in its fullest complexity. Whereas a geography that was one characterized by the participation in atrocity is almost by definition one which operates with a truncated view and understanding of humanity. I would appreciate as you look at Anne Frank Wake, one of our faculty has just put a question in there, helping especially our student body understand this notion of multiple moral universes. How to help frame that and to unpack that so that they can start to understand their own sense of a moral universe. Well, if I, if I was speaking, um, and as speaking to your students, one of the things that the current time we live in is that we have people, and it has become very clear in a significant reporting, significant reflection about people living in different media universes, about people living in different cognitive universes, seeing the same phenomena, but having radically different uh, descriptions of what's going on. And that's been something that has uh, created particular difficulties in terms of friendships, in terms of families, because what people find themselves is trying to understand how people whom they've loved their entire lives, people who have shaped who and what they are, people who have given them the things with which they go to the world, they discover was someone who stormed the Capitol in Jan on January 6th. They discover is someone who buys into the QAnon conspiracy theory, which as we call, I mean, if it's called very clearly, it's a white supremacist ideology that seeks the overthrow of our democracy, right? And so many of students, and I think many people in general, don't have any way to understand what's going on because the only alternative seems to be able to say that my uncle is a bad person, my aunt is a bad person, my father is a bad person, and that's not what we know about them. But if we understand that we may be living in different moral universes, then there may be ways that not only can we better understand their motivation, but we can also recognize the seduction of how it is that they got where they got to and how it is that we don't get there. So I guess what I'm trying to suggest is this can provide you an apparatus a way of thinking about these very different ways of looking at the world that are fundamentally different moral visions of what the world ought to be in ways that don't leave you in the position of necessarily becoming homeless existentially because the people whom you have loved and who have raised you have become unrecognizable to you. Anne Frank Wake is our, one of our faculty members in the English department. She has a question there. What role would you say education plays in your geographical paradigming? What is the role which you have been, you yourself have been a, an active agent faculty teaching for many years before you took the wonderful job of being president? Yes, indeed. Yes, and, and, and I certainly miss the classroom. Well, I think that the role of teaching is two things. One, um, we can choose whether or not we are going to teach what I described as the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, as the conceit of modernity, as if it is simply the rule. Or we can problematize it and seek to teach students to have a kind of curiosity that allows them to engage in 
a kind of uh, uh, both a reflection on as well as existential involvement in the kinds of moral universes and constructing and making decisions about how one is going to uh, comport oneself and how one is going to live one's life. So I think that education is significant in terms of how we teach what it is that is the moral quote unquote imperative. Do we take uh, the word of Kant and do we take the word of Hegel, both of whom were rabid racist and both of whom, um, if you step back, many of their ideas begin to make a different kind of sense? Or do we accept that certainly they were the reigning paradigm um, but that there is a need for us to engage in a different complexity. And I think ultimately that many people who are in our classrooms, whether undergraduate or in graduate school, are actually yearning and hungry for that kind of engagement, as opposed to simply a formation in the canons of Western intellectual traditions, many of which not only contributed to the construction of the conditions um, that allowed the Holocaust to unfold, but actually shaped the good people that were its prerequisite. So David, as on the line, I'm hoping everybody can see the great chat questions that are going on. I want to direct one because partially because I think one of you has raised the work of Howard Thurman. And the thankfully growing sense of the role that Howard Thurman plays in our society and many, many of our young people have no idea who this commanding person is. But the question is moral recovery from moral injury might be helped in developing contemplative practices while engaging in social transformation, such as the work of Howard Thurman. Yeah, I mean, I think that certainly uh, thinking about um, uh, moral recovery and moral injury are significant. Um, um, I think that, you know, in terms of making a connection, I would have to think more fully about that because uh, here I'm just thinking about broad scale, um, the matrices in which these happen. But certainly I think Thurman provides a way for one, people who have been injured in terms of having been on the receiving end of um, evil, uh, not themselves. And there's a great book that I, that I always talk about in the title of that not becoming the monsters which they have beheld. So when the kind of moral injury that you're talking about is that people have sustained and lived in uh, sustained situations of oppression and of evil, not then becoming a mirror of what they have experienced. Because recall, the only thing that oppression teaches us are its mechanics. It doesn't teach us mercy. It doesn't teach us care. So following that, one of our faculty in the library, could you describe some of the qualities or characteristics of those blank spaces where people refuse to participate in or actively resisted atrocity? What are the characteristics? Well, I would say um, that's why I would refer you to read the book, Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. Because I mean, I think a significant part and provocation for this lecture is that those areas have not been studied enough, right? What has been studied and uh, are individuals Right, so we get Schindler's List. We get stories of the righteous Gentiles who saved Jews, but rarely do we get stories of these geography, these spaces, because we are so prone to focus on the spaces of atrocity that we ignore those. So, so I would simply refer um, um, uh, the question to less innocent blood be shed because the entire point of the lecture is that it's work that needs to be done. So I just learned that people can't see in the chat the questions. Miladin has a question and then there is a, a theme that's coming through. Does this lead to moral relativism? And are you comfortable with that, Dr. Ray? 
Well, moral relativism presumes that there is one right answer and you're simply trying to muddy the waters. One of the reasons why I use the idea of the multiverse as opposed to talking about a relativist approach to it is that what I want to suggest is that in their own sphere, these moral universes have the capacity to be absolute but the point um, is that it's not necessarily a weakening of one and a strengthening of another because a space of non-atrocity is not a weak form of a space of atrocity. A space of atrocity is not a weak form of a space of non-atrocity. So I think moral relativism is an entirely different conversation, um, but one of the ways that I try to avoid that and I tried to, uh, is to be, use the category of a multiverse to talk about ways of um, uh, describing particular geographies and the things that happen with them. And that's the other point, right, is what I'm describing and what I'm interested in is what's happening in particular geographies, right? Not in terms of people's inclinations, not in terms of people's simply ways of thinking about the world, but what is happening in particular geographies and trying to make sense then of the moral universe that is uh, a part of that. So, I mean, if any of you, um, uh, my wife turned me on to this, but some of you Marvel fans, you may have watched WandaVision recently. And remember she took an entire town and she put this, this cube around the entire town. Well, I mean, that's one way of visualizing is that when something actually changes a geography of a place so that it is unlike the contiguous geography of the spaces to which it's connected. So when one county doesn't have any lynchings at all, even though the racial dynamics are largely the same, relations are largely the same, and the county next door has 10 lynchings in one year, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, so that may be a way of thinking about it. But um, yeah, once again, I don't think moral relativism um, uh, is an issue here. Maladin, you have a question, and I have a wonderful question for one of our great students. Thank you so much for your talk. Stephen, this was really inspiring. It made me think about so many different things based on your title, where you use this uh, interesting combination between geographies on one hand and then goodness and evil on the other. I was thinking in terms of your concept of multiple moral universes, is it descriptive as I would imagine geography is? or is it interpretative or prescriptive, normative, where things like good and evil come in? Or how do you jump from one, from, as they say, from an is to an ought, or over that, you know, uh, ditch of, uh, you know, from <laughs> uh, having those, uh, and you used Kant, you mentioned, and then, uh, you know, going from the side of, uh, something particular contingent to the side of something that is just out there and, and seen by everyone? Um, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I think where I'd begin would be to say that when we talk about goodness and evil, um, uh, you know, and it's the subject of, an, of, uh, of a whole nother lecture, but, you know, the description of um, uh, um, goodness and evil that I've worked with um, uh, and you know, you've seen in some of my work, is that goodness is the well-being of my neighbor and of God's creation, period. Right, that, that, that's what the basic goodness is. Evil is the disruption and the denial of the well-being of my neighbor and of God's creation. So, I mean, you know, I can unfold that in, in many more ways. So what that means then is that there's a descriptive side of it. That's why I, I want to keep using the language that Haley uses in terms of a place that goodness happened. So we're able to descriptively see it and talk about it. Um, but we're also able to see the possibility that even in the midst of 
um, uh, uh, you know, uh, reigning ideologies that have the force of arms, that those spaces aren't extinguished, that they can't exist. Now, where we go from there, I will be, I will admit that's further thinking that I need to do. And if I ever find time, um, um, uh, um, that, you know, that's what the rest of the book is about. Uh, but, you know, this is what the basis of it is. And one of the ways of, um, you know, thinking about the whole piece, when we talk about Kant, but then also moving to Hegel, is that a definition of goodness that is anchored in the flesh of my neighbor and in the substance of creation, where goodness is the flourishing thereof and where evil is the diminution and destruction thereof. It might be helpful Dr. Ray, to use this question by one of the students. Um, how do we utilize moral recovery for those individuals and institutions that work to uphold oppression and violence at the political level, local, state, nationally? Utilize moral recovery. Um. Well, here I'm going to lean a little bit on my um, um, uh, Calvinist tendencies. I simply leave them to God and I work on behalf of those who are being destroyed by their policies. So I leave their salvation to God. So in terms of moral recovery, I don't want to deny that people can um, engage in a kind of moral recovery that will lead them to use a religious language of repentance and a conversion in terms of the ways in which they're living their lives and utilizing their power. But I also know that being concerned with their moral injury can consume us such that we're not being attentive to dealing with the real physical injuries that are being done to those who are being victimized by their policies. So one person ties together Schindler's factory. It would maybe be a great example of creating a white space in the geography. And one other person has put together what I think a lot of us have on our mind, the commanding book of um, Isabella Wilkerson's cast that has taken the stage across the nation. That, and, and she is actually, speaking to the Board of Rabbis for the reform tradition. Any involvement in these conversations, sir? Um, so I'm looking at the question. Um, no, I, maybe it's a, oh, okay. Um, well, say, say it a different way. Say it a different way, uh, Scott. I think um, one, this one connection to the Schindler's factory and how it created space for a, a white space, a safe space, a geography in your, in your construction. And how do you juxtapose that with this book that is really helping us understand caste structures in India, Nazi Germany, and the United okay. States? Okay. Well, I think one of the things to recognize, and you know, that was the whole point of my description of the people of Le Chambon, right? Is that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be someone who is, to use the language of today, um, a, a non-racist uh, woke person to be able to live in the midst of a geography that doesn't participate in atrocity. Right? You don't have to be someone who lives a mor quote unquote morally exemplary life in order to inhabit a space of non-participation with atrocity. So what that means is that we have these deep and founding structures which chaos points to. And I would argue that race is one of them in terms of modernity and, and the world that was constructed from modernity, the uh, colonialized world, and those become the inescapable term of our existence. So for instance, um, 
you know, there's a significant sort of way in which our entire uh, society, in terms of Western civilization, is so awash in anti-Semitism that it's very difficult not to bear some of that in the way you uh, uh, work in the world, in the way you live in the world. But that doesn't mean that you can't create a white space. Right, so for me then, um, and you know, I'm going back to my Calvinist roots is, and, and I'll just be blunt, I don't give a damn what's in your heart. What are you materializing in the world? What kind of space are you creating in the world in terms of the moral imagination which takes material form? See, that's the key, right? It's not moral imagination. That's something that we sit back with a bourbon with. I mean, that's always a wonderful thing too. But what kind of world is the moral imagination that's being brought to bear activating? Is it activating a world of spaces in which in spite of contiguous atrocity, these are still spaces in which life can exist? Or is it creating space for atrocity to flourish? This is exactly where I think we can end on because it's almost 8.30 and it is late on a Sunday night. One, will you all join me in thanking Dr. Stephen Ray, the president of Chicago Theological Seminary for a commanding, engaging and inspiring lecture it's a call. I hear a call to actually start to recast our imagination. And to do that for all the students and all the faculty that are helping us, we have these conversations set up starting tomorrow with our pre-law advisor, Lisa, and through the week, it'll happen in multiple places. There'll be an email out about that again tomorrow. Tomorrow night, will you hold our Muslim community as we begin Ramadan tomorrow night. And we start the 30 days of fasting. And in that, we also have a chance to imagine our own lives in a different way. Stephen, on behalf of the committee and the university, I can't tell you how thankful I am for your friendship and your inspiration. We know that our relationships just keep growing and it will keep going. We are in the 150th anniversary and there are things that need to happen to move together. So tonight, we thank you for all that has been. We look forward to the next rounds of our work in the Holocaust team and throughout the university and with Chicago Theological. But for all of this, we give blessings and send you off now. Go have a bourbon or a vodka or relax. Back to your studies, students. Thank you all so much. Take care. Blessings to all of you. Good night. Thank you.